Hey guys, good morning. So I uh, spent a lot of years uh, in Oklahoma before coming out here, and one of the things I had a chance to do when I was in Oklahoma was uh, serve on a campus ministry board at the University of Oklahoma. So I became an OU fan, I became a big fan of college football stuff, which doesn't matter to you guys at all. Most of us in New Mexico don't actually know that college football exists, because all we have is the Lobos, and we can talk about that if we want to, but that's a boring sermon. So uh, we're going to talk this morning, though, about some stuff that I experienced when I was out there working on that campus ministry. The campus ministry, the, the goal of the ministry was to, to, to bring students to, to a relationship with Jesus and to strengthen them so that in that environment, in a really hard environment, they were going to be able to, to shine like lights in the darkness. And you would recruit these students out of high school, even out of church camp, if you saw them before they were going to OU, and you would recruit them and you would try to get them excited about being a part of this, because something would happen as soon as they got there. I don't know if they have this at UNM or New Mexico State or colleges around here, but one of the things that they did at OU was a week of, of, of kind of like events built around recruiting freshmen into your different organizations. And so uh, they would have this organizational recruitment, and the, the director of the campus ministry said, if we don't reach our students that week, we are going to lose them. And I was like, that's ah, kind of weird. I mean, I talked to these kids at camp. I know that they're going to show up. They'll be a part of our ministry. But ultimately, what normally happened is a student would go and say, I'm going to try out that organization. Like the first week that they're there, they'd say, I'm going to try out the, uh, you know, I don't know, FFA or, the, or, or, or whatever organization they got to be a part of. And then for the next four to five years of their lives, they were attending that one organization every single week. It actually, that one decision that they made in August of their freshman year ultimately dictated what they did for the next four years of their lives. And from that, kind of what their passions were for the next 20 or 30 years of their lives. Some of us understand what that's like, right? Where, where we make one decision and it ultimately like guides the path of our lives to a way that we didn't anticipate we never set out to be there. We just ended up there. And have you guys ever had that happen to you? Where like, I, I thought that was not a big deal, and here it was. And you can think of it in really cool ways. You know, maybe you decided one day to, to, to go to a different store and you met your wife at that store. But you can also look at it in, in terrible ways. How many of you guys used to smoke? We have anybody in here used to smoke? We got some people used to smoke. How many of you set out to be smokers? Thought, you know what I want to do? I want to spend the next 30 years of my life dropping... Tons of cash on cigarettes. No. It was a decision you made one day, thinking, that's cool, my friends are doing it, I'm just going to give it a shot. And then pretty quickly, it became a part of your life. Some of us, it became a big part of our life, right? That's, that's how these things work. You end up in a place you never set out to be. Some of us have a career that's that way. I'll be honest with you, I never anticipated going into ministry when I was a young person, this was not the passion of my life. I'm thankful for what God has done. But I never set out to be here. I never thought that this is where it would be. But a culmination of God's leading and, and a culmination of a few decisions have led me to the place where here we are today. Some of those things like that I'm very thankful for, but there are other things where I'm not. And oftentimes, those decisions were made because I was listening to the voice of someone else. You listen to people, you follow their examples, maybe you take a chance, but you end up in a place you never anticipated. What I want to talk to you guys about today is that. As we look around, Brandon just prayed for Israel, and as we look around what's happening in Israel today, we have people who are doing terribly evil things, who did a terribly evil thing last weekend. They crossed in, and they, they murdered, and they hurt, and they did awful things, and they were led by people who would say, well, I am speaking for God and you should listen to me. I guarantee you the people that did those things last weekend when they were four years old were not sitting there thinking, I can't wait until I get a chance to do this atrocious thing. But they listened to the words of somebody who claimed to be speaking for God. They listened to the words of somebody who claimed to be speaking for Allah and they said, well, this is what I'm going to do. And as you grow it becomes more and more and more a part of your life because you think that what is being spoken to you is the truth. So today what we need to do is we need to talk about truth. We need to talk about where we get our truth from because if we don't, if we don't understand where we are finding our truth, if we don't understand where it is that we are finding what it is that is right, we will end up in a place that we never anticipated going. 
we'll end up thinking or believing or doing things that we never anticipated thinking or believing or doing. So we're going to be looking in Hebrews chapter 3. I think the timing of this is important. In Hebrews chapter 3 today, and beginning of chapter 4, if you guys want to turn in your Bibles, please turn there. Um, if you don't have a Bible, you can use one of these in the seat in front of you. We're going to be on a page 1002. If you'd like to keep one of these Bibles and take it home with you and, and use it, we, we want you to do that because we want everybody to have God's Word in front of them. But what we're going to see today is that Jesus is greater than the prophets, that Jesus is greater than, than, than the prophets, even of the Old Testament, that he is, he is greater than them. But we're also going to ask the question today as we're going through this, do we find ourselves following people as prophets in our own lives? And are we being led the right direction? So, quick question, what's a prophet? Anybody have any idea what a prophet is? You can spit it out, what do you think? Somebody who speaks for God, right? We have this idea of a prophet as somebody who speaks the future. Well, actually, a prophet is this. Jerry, tell everybody that it's Sunday. You've got to say it louder than that. It's Sunday. All right. What Jerry just did was be my prophet. I gave him a message, and he spoke it out. Simple, simple definition of a prophet is that. A prophet is somebody who has somebody else's message, and they speak it out. So a prophet of God is somebody who has God's message, and he speaks it out. Hey, that's a lot more simple than we often think of it as. What a prophet is, is that. And today what we're going to see is that there are people who claim to be prophets of God or prophets of truth that can lead us in directions that we never anticipated being. So let's jump into that. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1 through 3, and we're going to see what we can see. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses was also faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. All right. You ever tried to... Um, jump into an argument that you weren't a part of or catch up in an argument that you weren't a part of. Maybe, maybe somebody says, hey, I need you to, to help me out with this. And then you have to try and, and gather all of the information about the argument and try to figure out what is happening in this and it's confusing and it's awkward and it's weird. We are jumping into an argument right now that we have not had. All right, In the first century, in the church of the first century, uh, there were a lot of different cultures that were coming together. For us, it's, it's hard to understand because we have lived in an experience. Even if you didn't grow up in the church, you have been surrounded by, by the, the fragrance of the church that is, is spoken into all kinds of different areas of our lives. And it's, it's, it, there's been a lot of truths that have been hammered out. But in the first century, you had Jewish people who uh, had lived their entire lives up until coming to know Jesus, building their lives around the laws of Moses. And then you had other people, Gentile people, who um, had, did not adopted the laws of Moses, but they had been brought together underneath the cross of Christ, and they were working together. And you had this church. And the church argument, the, 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 the argument that was going on inside the church was, Jesus is great, but what about Moses? Isn't Moses, the word, aren't the words of Moses just as important? Now, if you lived before Christ, if you were a Jewish person, you, you had lived your entire life following uh, the Pentateuch, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. You had been, for, for most of us, the laws that we can think of when we come up, think about the Bible are all actually laws that come from the first five books. They're laws of Moses, that God gave Moses. And so in that first century, in that early church, there would be people who would say, yeah, I, I believe in Jesus, but I the most important thing to me is, what does Moses say about this? And other people would say, well, I, I hear what you're saying about Moses, but Jesus is our Savior, and, and we should follow these things. Now, Moses and Jesus don't contradict. They don't contradict. But there were people who said, well, I'm attaching myself to this law of Moses that Jesus ultimately fulfilled, and that law still stands. It's the same thing we talked about in Galatians here a while back. But this, this argument led to a place where there were people who said, I've got to follow Moses. He's the most, most important thing. His laws are the most important thing in my life. I need to make sure that I'm keeping the ceremonial laws. I make sure I'm, I'm keeping these other things. I need to make sure that these things are happening. Moses really mattered. Through traditions, 
really mattered. So question, how important is tradition for us in our lives? Does tradition ever become something to us that ultimately dominates the way that we see the life that we live? For the people of the first century, it was a major part. And what the writer of Hebrews tells us in this situation, and I love verse 3, for Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the, of, as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. Moses didn't contradict Jesus, but Moses was leading towards Jesus, and he was part of what Jesus used to build up the house, the church. So verse 4 through 6, we see this. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and are boasting in our hope. Moses came to build up the house, which is the church, but Jesus is the, the, the ruler over the house, and, and we are in the house of God. So here's the truth. There is no prophet greater than Jesus. There is no person that supersedes Jesus. That's what the writer of Hebrews is saying right here. Even the prophets of the Old Testament, they, they came to build up the work that Jesus was doing, not to be the work themselves. In the first century, it was tempting to say that the we follow the law of God, and, and that is enough. But those laws were fulfilled in the teachings of Jesus. Jesus ultimately was the ultimate authority. Now, this gets to where we are in some ways today. When I was talking about what happened in Israel last week, that's crazy. It's crazy to think that anyone would think, yeah, I'm going to do the will of God by going and mutilating babies or I'm doing the will of God by doing something that everybody else would consider as a horrible, atrocious evil. But it makes sense when you think about the culmination of following people that aren't of God. Once you start down a path where Jesus is not the ultimate answer, what you do is you can be convinced of things that simply aren't true. Because the word of Jesus sometimes makes us very uncomfortable with where it is that we would want to be. Jesus is the truth, but sometimes his commandments are uncomfortable. And you may say, what are you talking about, Jim? Well, I'll tell you what I'm talking about. How many of you are truly uncomfortable, if we're being honest, with the idea that I need to forgive everyone who's wronged me because Jesus has forgiven me? Does that make anybody else uncomfortable other than me? It makes me uncomfortable. I know that it makes me uncomfortable because I just had to face this here a, a couple weeks ago. So uh, a couple weeks ago, I wasn't here. My, my, it's crazy I'm not telling you this. I don't, I don't need sympathy. I'm just sharing with you the story. My stepfather passed away a couple weeks ago. So I, I had to do that. I had to go down to Florida to, to, to deal with the ramifications of that. And in that, I got to see a lot of pictures. I got to see a lot of pictures from, from my past, and I got to see pictures of, of my family together, and, and, you know, elementary kid, junior high kid, high school kid. You guys know those feelings. You go through that stuff. And there's a lot of stuff there that's really happy, but there are also some things that are not. Do you know the feeling of seeing something and remember the place where you were at and remember the pain that you were at when you see those pictures? For a long chunk of my early childhood and into adulthood, I, I actually carried a lot of bitterness and hard, angry feelings towards my stepbrother because he felt like he was part of the reason I had my struggles. I really struggled with my stepfather. I had a lot of anger towards him. He said a lot of things that were not good. He said a lot of things that were not uplifting. And I carried a lot of hardship and bitterness and anger towards those things. I carried them into college. I was actually sitting in a chapel service at the Bible college that I went to one day, and I was confronted with the words of Jesus. You may know this, you may not, but if you go and you read Matthew 6, Jesus teaches the disciples how to pray. And you guys know, our Father in heaven, holy is your name, our kingdom come, our will be done, your, your kingdom come, your will be done, all that stuff. That right as soon as the, the, Jesus finishes teaching the disciples how to pray, his next words, the next words out of his mouth are, 
For if you forgive your brothers when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive your brothers, your heavenly Father will not forgive you. I don't like it. I'm just being honest with you. It made me uncomfortable. And I was sitting in a chapel service, and the preacher was standing up here just like I'm standing up here right now. He was standing in a, in a little tiny chapel in Dallas, Texas, and he's telling me this, and he's, he's saying this. And as he is saying this, the Holy Spirit, I can promise you this, was confronting me in my heart, and it was crushing me. Because as I'm hearing this, I'm hearing, you have to forgive your stepfather. He is not the reason why you have your struggles. You're going to have to let this go. You're going to have to let this go. And I'm arguing. Maybe you've been here, maybe you're not, but I'm arguing in a seat. I was actually sitting right around there in the chapel service. I was sitting there, and I'm arguing with God in this seat as this is going on. I don't want to do this. And as this was going on, we finished up, and everybody else got up to sing, and I dropped down to my knees, and I said, God, give me the strength to forgive my stepfather. And you can believe me if you want to, you don't have to, but at that moment when I, I prayed that, I felt a weight lift off my shoulders and the way that I saw my stepfather changed. He did not become a good man after that in a different way immediately. Like, oh, that's great, it's not that. But what, I, what happened, and I believe that this is from God, is I saw him as a broken angry man who needed to know the love of Jesus instead of as the reason I had my problems. I was able to see him in the same way that God saw him instead of the way that I wanted to see him. The work of Jesus is uncomfortable. Jesus is uncomfortable. We have this picture of Jesus of a soft, nice, kind man holding a lamb and giving a baby a piggyback ride. That's not who Jesus was. It's not who he is. If it is, why would they kill him? Ain't nobody killing your babysitter. Jesus didn't come to be a babysitter. Jesus confronted the easy, direct passions of our flesh and set us in a different way, the way that God had created us to be. Do you want to know why people are so willing to go off and kill and murder and maim? Because it feels good. It felt good for them because they had been wronged in their minds, and it was time to get revenge. But it doesn't make it right. One of the reasons it was hard for me to forgive because it kind of felt good to have somebody to blame. I had a reason. I had a chip that I was able to carry. And any time something went wrong, I was to say, well, that's not my fault. I was able to carry that and hold on to that and run with that. But I could not be the man that God wanted me to be as long as I was holding on to that. And that's why Jesus came beyond just dying for our sins. But he came to confront the easy, fleshly things that we want to do. And that's the battle, right? Jesus is, is, is God in the flesh. Jesus came to direct us. Jesus came to, to guide us. In other religions, what they will do is they will downplay Jesus and they will build up their prophets and they will say, well, Jesus was great. He was a good man. He was a, he was a good teacher or he was a prophet of God and he, he redirected, but he was, he was not the Son of God. He was not the hope. He was not our salvation. They will belittle Jesus because that's what Satan wants to do. If Jesus is not God, we still have to find our own way our saves to save ourselves. If Jesus is not God, we're going to be guided towards whatever passions that we want to follow and we're going to say, well, it's got to be good because it feels right. And we will end up deeper and deeper and deeper in this place of bitterness. Or we'll end up deeper and deeper and deeper in this place where our flesh controls us and our lusts just own us and we can't even sleep because of the battles that are going on inside. 
But what Jesus did has died for us. He is greater than any prophet. He is greater than any being that has ever existed because he is from eternity. Continue with me in verse 12 through 17. Take care, brothers. Lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who was there who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies fell fell in the wilderness? So the writer of Hebrews brings in something that feels a little esoteric for us. But it's a really big deal. He says, look, there were people who were following Moses, and, and they actually left with Moses in the desert, but even as they followed Moses, they, they ended up following their own passions. They ended up falling short. They missed out on the promises of God. Jesus is greater than Moses because following him and following example leaves us in no place where we can end up in a place where we're completely outside of where we should have been. We can be led astray so easily. Moses was well-intentioned. He was a good man, but he was not the Messiah. Ultimately, Jesus died to save our hearts, not just our actions. And we can be. We can be led astray super easily. We can end up in a place we did never intend to end up super easily. And so we need to understand today, this is what the writer is is talking to us about today as as we see this, that that there are no prophets that ultimately are going to save us. There are no people who, uh, modern people who are just going to say some kind of truth that is deeper than anything that is going to be different than Jesus, but guide us in the right way. Paul sums this up in such an easy way in Galatians chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. Even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. It doesn't matter if it's an angel. It doesn't matter if it's a person. It doesn't matter if it's somebody who claims to be a prophet. If they are preaching to you something different than the good news of Jesus, they should be accursed. This is a daily challenge that the writer says. He says, so I love that, actually. I really do love that in verse 13. He says, um, But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you should be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. If we're being honest, most of us know that there are voices that are coming into our lives today that preach some stuff that feels pretty good, but we know it's really not the way that Jesus has called us to be riling us up towards anger or riling us out ourselves up towards making decisions in relationships that, that we should never make or riling ourselves up towards things that we know are not of God. And we fall into that because it just feels good. And sometimes it just feels right. It feels right because it matches up with everything that I want to believe. So I want to ask you a question today. What do you do to stay diligent? What do you do to to keep your life focused on the the work that God has for you, not just what feels good in the moment? What do you do to, to keep your focus built on the things that Jesus has done for you? How do you do that? Because ultimately, this is faith. Right? We're going to talk here at Hebrews 11 here in a few weeks about faith is, is believing the things that we don't see. Well, faith today, in the way that we live our lives, is believing that the Word of God expressed through Christ is the truth and living that out even when it makes me uncomfortable. When I was talking about forgiveness, faith in, faith in God is what required me to be able to forgive. When we talk about 
uh, avoiding my eyes from the things that I know I'm, I'm ultimately going to tear me away from God, are going to tear me away from my relationship with God, are going to tear me away from my relationship with my wife. These are the things that I have to do because I have faith in God, and I have to trust that when he says don't do that, he knows what he's talking about, even, that, even though in the moment doing that may feel like a good or right thing. Faith is believing that the work of Jesus is enough. So we're going to finish today with Hebrews chapter 11, or 4, chapter, uh, verse, chapter 4, verse 11 through 13. As we skip forward a little bit here, I want to share this with you, and then I'll give you my bottom line. I love this, this passage right here as we finish out. It says, Let us therefore strive to enter this rest, so that no one may fall short of the same sort of disobedience, talking about falling away, for the, the, falling away from what Jesus has for us. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword or two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and of spirit and joints and of marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. What do you do to stay diligent? And my challenge, my understanding of this, is that when you read the word of God and when you trust the work of Jesus, his word will do like it did with me that chapel service, and it will cut you. I'm going to cut you. That sounds painful. But I actually had a conversation with a lady here a couple weeks ago um, who came and said that she was hearing the word, and she came to church here. Um, and she was hearing, hearing a message, and as she was, and maybe you've experienced this, it felt like the word was cutting her right in the heart. And it was hitting her close. And she realized in that moment, I have to do something. The Word of God is living, and it's active. It hits you, and it works on you. And it challenges you to cuts away things that don't need to be there. And it builds up things that you don't want to be built up sometimes. And it challenges you, where are you finding your truth? It's uncomfortable because ultimately the Word of God will challenge you to maybe step away from people or voices that are taking you from the things that God has for you. But it also puts you in a place where regardless of what happens, you know that the truth is out in front of you and you're not heading the wrong way. So my bottom line for you guys today is, is a simple one. No voice should ever, have, ever be greater than the voice of Jesus. Where are you finding your truth? And I, that, that, the term, your truth, is a very postmodern idea that everything, I have your truth and you have my, your truth and all these things or whatever it is. Ultimately, the truth is not in what people are saying, it's in what Jesus has done for us and who he is. And anything else, it's going to guide us in a place that we don't end up anticipating going. So I want to ask you, where do you find your truth? Because any voice that is greater than, Je greater than Jesus is going to guide you the wrong way. Following Jesus is going to be hard. Anybody who tells you that it's not is lying to you. Following Jesus is going to make you forgive people. You don't necessarily want to forgive, but I can promise you on the back end it's better. Following Jesus is going to make you avert your eyes from things that you don't need. It's going to make you maybe turn away from things that you lean on for crutches. It may alienate your family. You may lose friends. It is a narrow road. But when you let Jesus' standard be your standard of life, you will find that the, the direction of your life is much more simple. The actions may be hard, but the direction is clear. So I've got three things I want to ask you to do today. One, I want you to evaluate who has a voice in your life. This is what I want you to do with your head. Who gets you riled up and angry or who gets you riled up and emotional? For many of us, we, we have Jesus, but we also have what we see on the news. Or for many of us, we have Jesus, but we also have what we hear from our friends. For many of us, we have Jesus, but we also have these other voices that, if we're honest, have more sway because they're more immediate. Part of the reason it's hard for us to, 
to let Jesus be the voice in our lives is because we think of him only as the one who's going to take us to heaven when we die. And we're not worried about that. We're worried about now. The truth of the matter is Jesus is worried about now as well. He has guided us here and guided us to his spirit so we can be guided right now. Who is it that has a voice in your life? Evaluate that. And then pray in your heart. Pray daily this week that you will turn, pray daily this week before you turn on anything that will influence you in your heart. Pray that before you put in an influence into your life, pray that those that only God's word through Jesus will be your influence. It's time for us to change the trajectory of our lives. It's not going to happen overnight, but it happens as we change our thought life. And then the last thing I want to ask you guys to do, and this is a practical thing with your hands, I want to ask you to do something very practical. I want to ask you to listen to the book of Mark on your phones this, uh, this week. Maybe listen to a chapter a day. I want you to get to know Jesus in a new way again. For many of us, we, we, we hear these things and we, we don't necessarily know the work of God. We, we, we know some stories that we've heard in Sunday school and we know the, the sermons that the preachers have preached. But take some time to sit down and listen to what Jesus did. Mark is a very short, simple gospel book. And as you listen to a chapter, ask yourself, what would I have seen if I was there? What would I have seen or what would I have noticed as Jesus was healing this man who was possessed by a demon? What was it like to see somebody possessed by a demon throwing himself at the feet of Jesus? What would I have seen from this man who's obviously scary to the world because they wanted to get rid of him. You'll be surprised if you read the book of Mark how quickly they're ready to kill this guy. Because what Jesus did is greater than anything that this world wants to give you. Today I promise you the truth of Jesus will guide you in a direction that you'll never have to be ashamed about.